Well, welcome to this month's Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name's Andrew Murray. My name's Sarah Johannesson Murray. Uh, for those of you who perhaps have never listened to our shows, which run every third Friday of the month from 7 to 8 p.m., we're both licensed medical herbalists who trained in England and graduated there with a degree in herbal medicine. We run a clinic in Garberville where we consult with clients about a wide range of conditions and we recommend herbal medicine and dietary advice. Uh, this month we wanted to continue exploring the positive role that sugar has to play in the diet and why good sugars are essential for good health. It seems that many things uh, we're told are bad for us are actually beneficial and we need to see the facts and the research that's out there. So with an ever-increasing uh, worldwide prevalence of so-called diagnosed diabetes, what is it about sugar that we can defend? Uh, we're excited to have Dr. Ray Pete with us again this month, and we'll be hearing from him on scientific research-based facts. So you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garbaville 91.1 FM, and from 7.30 till the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions either related or unrelated to this month's topic of dietary sugars and the protection they offer. The number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911, or if you live outside the area, the toll-free number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. So, Dr. P, thank you for joining us again. Hi. Okay, well, as always, I think there's uh, new listeners, people that perhaps have never heard you speak, so... Uh, would you please just introduce yourself and your academic uh, slash professional background? Oh, um, I've been um, writing a newsletter on health issues for about 30 years, and uh, I started that uh, about eight years after finishing my Ph.D. research at the University of Oregon. Um, uh, part of the reason for starting my own newsletter was seeing that the um, journals, science journals, are very doctrinaire and influenced by industry. So uh, since doing my uh, study at the University of Oregon, I've been uh, reading lots and uh, experimenting some on my own. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I know that uh, you've published many articles uh, and your specialisms are uh, hormones, uh, pregnenolone, estrogen, um, protective hormones, the uh, things that we'd normally uh, would confer some protection to people from aging and free radical damage, etc. But uh, your other specialties are thyroid and polyunsaturated fats, and uh, I know you've done a lot of research on that. The um, sugar issue, uh, again, I know we were joined, uh, you joined us rather, sorry, last month, uh, and we got uh, some of the way through uh, expanding on why sugars are good for you. Because, uh, as you mentioned earlier in your introduction, the uh, common doctrination is that, that uh, sugars are bad for you, just like salt is bad for you, uh, just like uh, saturated fats are bad for you. And that is the doctrine. It, it seems, that, and I'm finding out as time goes by, for me, because I'm not, I'm not that old, uh, that actually a lot of the things that I was taught when I studied at university are actually not true. Um, Unfortunately, some of the basic facts that underlie the physiology were also in error, and that's I've had to kind of retrain my brain to think anew. So for those people that are listening now, and some of those people will be diagnosed as diabetic, um, some of those people will be diagnosed as uh, hypothyroid or hyperthyroid. And, um, so for those people that are listening, in terms of sugar and the way it's been um yeah, it's been bad pressed in the last 20 years or so, um, and they would have us eat less sugar. Well, that actually started about 200 years ago. <laughs> okay, anyway. 200, there you go. <laughs> okay, good. All right, well, that's a good start. So what's the history be behind why we started being told that sugar was bad for us 200 years ago? Um, at that time, they had defined diabetes as the sugar disease because they discovered glucose in the urine and the mechanically thinking doctors said, um, if you don't put glucose in, it can't come out. <laughs> but uh, in fact, the glucose was being produced by dissolving the protein in the person's body. And uh, it turned out that the worst thing you can do is to uh, starve them for sugar because that accelerates the breakdown of both protein and fat. And uh, two doctors at least in the 19th century went against that 
conventional opinion and uh, uh, started giving their patients the amount of sugar extra in their diet that they were losing in the urine, figuring that they would die more slowly uh, from diabetes. And uh, they found that they actually recovered very quickly. And uh, that curative effect of large amounts of of, uh, sugar have been fairly recently uh, demonstrated in um, animal experiments and in vitro experiments in which sugar stimulates the regeneration of pancreatic insulin-producing cells. Okay, so um, a basic question then. Do humans need sugar? And, yeah, um, monkeys, for example, uh, who normally live on on a fruit, uh, they found that when fruit is scarce, they develop very high cortisol levels. And uh, that is something that pretty much happens in in any animal that habitually has a mixed diet containing carbohydrate. Uh, some animals like like uh, reptiles can uh, get along nicely on on a protein diet. Uh, and we can turn protein into uh, sugar too, sugar and fat. But it happens that the um, one of the effects of the sugar is to inhibit the cortisol, which uh, turns protein into sugar. So we uh, spare protein, don't have to eat so much of it. And uh, that has some beneficial effects. Uh, the... The cortisol has many side effects other than breaking down the um, tissue proteins at the same time that it helps to digest protein foods. Uh, it it changes the uh, the whole arrangement of of the way that metabolism works. So it's better if we can minimize cortisol. And um, the sugars also inhibit the the chronic release of free fatty acids from storage uh, so that our body, our brain in particular, and uh, some tissues such as the red blood cells uh, strongly prefer um, sugars over fats and uh, function better. And when we get enough sugar, we inhibit the release of fats from storage and allow these tissues to have all the sugar they need. So it's basically a backup mechanism. When you don't eat sugar, your body will get the sugar from your protein, your muscles, your bones, your brain. It, uh, well, not only your um, the cortisol stimulated dissolves can dissolve various organs that will then release different free fatty acids and or um, proteins that the body will convert into sugar. So that's a less preferable backup mechanism. Is that what you're trying to describe, Dr. Pete? Um, yeah, and um, the famous Arctic explorer, uh, uh, I forget his, his name, uh, Bill Hjalmar uh, something, um, reported that uh, people that he, he knew their ages approximately seemed to be many years older by appearance than they really were. And uh, he he didn't exactly know what the cause of that was, but um, they were eating a mostly fat and meat diet. Mm-hmm. And when people uh, try to lose weight by uh, fasting, what happens is uh, for a day or so, their cortisol is still high, um, and their, their metabolic rate is fairly high. And so what they're living on temporarily is a meat diet as they dissolve their, their muscles and, and uh, uh, fat. And uh, the uh, thymus gland is one of the first to be dissolved. And since we would eat ourselves up in just a, uh, two or three weeks if we kept eating at the same rate, our metabolic rate slows down drastically under the influence of these free free amino acids liberated from our tissues. 
and uh, those turn the thyroid hormone off. The falling blood sugar and the rising uh, free amino acids and free fatty acids, all of these uh, turn our metabolic rate down. And uh, then we can get along on a very low calorie intake, mm. but uh, it slows down uh, reproductive function, brain function, everything. So basically fasting is the worst thing you can do if you're trying to lose weight. Um, yeah, or pretty much anything because uh, fasting uh, turns off the liver's ability to detoxify things. Uh, so you're exposing yourself to increased toxins rather than decreased. Uh, the only thing that benefits is the intestine from uh, not putting bad stuff into it. Right, it gives the intestine a break, but in, in the meantime, you harm your liver and uh-huh. and other organs. Okay, so in in terms of sugar as a as a, a quantity to consume, um, it's uh, I've heard that uh, you've said I think before 170 to 250 grams of sugar per day. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I think for a person okay. of normal activity and uh, eating mixed foods, that. So yeah. let's just discuss some of these sugars and which ones are good sugars and which ones are bad sugars. Uh, lactose has a lot of special properties, so it's a very good sugar. It's somewhat slowly absorbed, but it it stimulates digestion. So uh, it's something that people often overlook as a sugar. Um, it helps with the calcium metabolism absorbing the, the other nutrients in milk. Um, sucrose consists of, of one unit of glucose and one of fructose. And uh, that is fairly quickly uh, broken into the components when we eat it. And the glucose stimulates insulin. And uh, when they're eaten together, fructose Besides not itself stimulating insulin, it actually slightly inhibits the release of insulin. Um, so if you ate pure glucose, you would get a stronger insulin reaction. And in most situations, if you eat slightly faster than you're metabolizing, uh, a surge of excess glucose is going to turn on your fat metabolism. And so when you take sucrose uh, with a little bit of um, the, the fructose component, it will uh, moderate the secretion of insulin and the, the production of fat depots. Okay, because if something stimu- stimulates insulin, if a sugar stimulates insulin production, then your liver's not happy and you store that sugar as fat. So we want to be eating the types of sugars that don't strongly stimulate insulin so we can use the sugar in our liver and stimulate metabolism. And uh, surprisingly, the fructose, besides moderating the production of fat, which can lead to stress and so on, uh, it does many other uh, things. It raises your temperature um, by a variety of mechanisms, uh, which all by itself will increase your metabolic rate. And it increases your consumption, conversion to energy of carbohydrate by about 20%. And uh, it'll do that even in a fairly small amount, but uh, with sucrose you have a 50-50 ratio. And um, it activates uh, several components of the thyroid system uh, better than, than glucose even. Uh, glucose is pretty essential for keeping the thyroid functioning optimally, but uh, fructose does uh, some extra things that uh, cause it to raise your temperature and metabolic rate more than glucose alone would. So the foods that these sugars are found in are fruits primarily? Mostly fruits. Mm -hmm. Mostly fruits and honey and white sugar are also... Um, have a little bit of fructose in them as well. Yeah. So then and when you're looking at the glycemic index, Dr. Pete, how would you 
describe this to people who are familiar diabetics looking at glycemic indexes? How would you describe why they should eat fruits and honey and stay away from any kind of starchy carbohydrates? Like uh, 30 or 40 years ago, there was quite a, a bit of uh, publishing activity uh, relating to the uh, anti-diabetes effects of fructose because exactly of that uh, stimulating effect on the metabolism. But um, something is happening uh, currently the last three or four years. Uh, besides forgetting all of that, they're inventing a lot of new stuff to direct people away from uh, the anti-diabetic effect of fructose. Um, the um, supposedly some of the motivation of that is the popularity of what they call the high fructose uh, corn syrup or corn sweeteners, and uh, those are uh, more fattening than sugar. But it isn't because they are actually high in fructose. Uh, they have slightly more fructose than glucose, but uh, a group in uh, Los Angeles a few weeks ago um, measured the amounts in some soft drinks and found that they accurately reported the the content of of uh, fructose and glucose. But when they hydrolyzed the material, they found that there was a much more carbohydrate in the drink than just the fructose and glucose. Uh, there was about four to five times as much uh, cal caloric value in some kind of carbohydrate present in the drink uh, that was not glucose or fructose. So if you have four or five times more uh, food in your uh, soda pop than, than you were thinking, you're uh, going to be more likely to get fat, not because fructose is fattening, but uh, just because you're getting a huge amount of uh, pretty much the equivalent of eating flour. So a huge amount of starch that strongly stimulates insulin, and insulin stores that starchy sugar as fat. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it was actually sucrose from white sugar, then it would be much easily much easier for your body to store as glycogen in the liver yeah so and there's lots of other reasons why i know corn syrup is a little bit of a hot topic right now but um there's also been reports that um high fructose corn syrup is quite high in heavy metals various heavy metals have you heard any of this research dr pete um yeah uh, there uh, a few years ago some samples were analyzed and then the uh, government decided to drop it as soon as they saw that uh, they were full of mercury. Uh, and then the um, industry supposedly corrected itself, but the government isn't keeping up on it. Well, I've noticed that a couple different um, soda pops now are being advertised that have sugar mm. rather than the corn syrup, the Pepsi, the Honeydew, and the, co uh, the Mexican Coca-Cola. <laughs> Coca-Cola needs to make a new Coca-Cola for America. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that the Coke company was suing the Mexican branch to make them stop using sugar because <laughs> so many Americans were importing it. <laughs> Sugar's and, fighting back. <laughs> and I spoke to the uh, late a chemist that w tests products in Mexico, and she said that the Mexican Coca-Cola in Mexico, now I don't know if that's the same stuff that gets imported here, but the Mexican Coca-Cola in Mexico will have sugar sometimes and corn syrup other times. So it's not, if you're drinking Coca-Cola in Mexico, you're not guaranteed that it is sugar or it's made with sugar. But anyhow, so... Um, I just wanted to just cover very briefly the uh, the amounts, the amount of uh, sugar in grams or uh, in ounces. We can do that conversion pretty quickly. It's probably uh, eight ounces of sugar a day. Uh, well, yeah. 250 grams. So. Five to six oh. ounces, isn't that what you would say, Dr. Pete? That yeah, it, uh, some people uh, can eat a lot more, but your appetite is a fairly good uh, guide. Uh, if you are eating more than 
you're going to need in the long run. Once your liver uh, has enough glycogen, it tends to turn off your appetite. Right. For everything or for, just, no, sugar? just for sugar? Right. Okay, because I know uh, last month uh, you outlined the uh, about eight hours for the glycogen stores in the liver to be depleted, and that was a fairly fairly rough average uh, that you would get from the stores. So, in terms of um, someone's diet, in order to keep up with their sugar consumption, so that the liver is adequately uh, primed with glycogen. Um, Maybe Sarah, you, I know because you uh, you look well, at you look at the weights and measures of foods. Well, so one glass of orange juice has contains 25 grams of sugar. Okay. One glass of milk contains 12 grams of sugar. And um, so it, one table one teaspoon of sugar only contains four grams of sugar. One tablespoon of honey contains about 17 grams of sugar. So if you're just looking at you know. Sugar, actual sugar, it's easier to get a lot more sugar in fruit than it is actually in sugar, white sugar. <laughs> and when you're eating fruit, the potassium and other minerals in the fruit um, really uh, bypass the whole issue of um, glycemic effect because mm -hmm. uh, the potassium itself has an insulin-like action that uh, helps you uh, turn sugar into glycogen. And uh, if if you ate too much, it would also uh, produce fat, except that the uh, presence of uh, the potassium with your sugar uh, means that it's going to uh, not produce uh, an excess of blood sugar. It's going to keep your blood sugar uh, pretty level compared to eating starches. Okay. I think the other thing that's a fairly popular misconception, uh, Dr. Pete, is that people, you know, whenever it's uh, brought up, uh, whether it's people that we're consulting with or just people, you know, friends and whatever, um, I think the general argument is that, that they defend uh, avoiding sugar by saying, well, you know, sugar in the diet will make you fat and it's bad for you. It'll increase your weight. But I think probably what's important to bring across from what you said is that the sugar will increase your metabolic rate and that in its own that in its own right uh, will speed your metabolism up yeah a 20 percent increase in your metabolic rate makes right. a tremendous difference yeah. in in how much you can eat without getting fat right and, and again the to stress the point that sugar is important so that you can well the right sugars the ones we've outlined especially fructose uh, sucrose and to some extent glucose then uh, it's important that those sh uh, sugars be consumed rather than the sugars that are essentially in the most American diets found in the starchy carbohydrates the pastas the pastries the you know, all, all those kind of things the high fructose corn syrup um, that it's important to get the right kind of sugars so that your liver has got an adequate store of glycogen and that your sugar consumption doesn't actually turn on your fat storage mechanism by stimulating cortisol like the uh, carbohydrates do um, one of the things that fructose does is to uh, protect against the fat deposition effect of, of insulin it not only restricts the mm -hmm. secretion of insulin itself but it uh, it sort of um, makes insulin less harmful by uh, uh, blocking in some way its uh, tendency to produce obesity uh, uh, publication that has been cited frequently to say that fructose is is dangerous because it has an uh, anti-insulin effect. Uh, that was the conclusion of, mm. of this group of five researchers. Uh, they gave a five-week diet only to rats, and they said at the end of the five weeks, those who ate a gigantic amount of, of fructose were insulin resistant they they um when given glucose uh, they maintained um, a higher level of both uh, glucose and insulin in their blood uh, and the implication was see in just five weeks we have made these wow. <laughs> animals diabetic but the thing that doesn't get often cited is that uh, those animals during five weeks uh, gained 
tremendously different amounts of weight. And if you had continued that same diet uh, for the rest of the year, the um, ones eating the starch-based diet would have weighed twice as much as the ones eating the sucrose diet. Okay. All right. For those people that are listening, uh, this you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville, uh, 91.1 FM. From 7.30 until the end of the show, you're invited to call in with any questions, either related or unrelated to this month's continuing topic of dietary sugars and the protection and benefits that sugars, those good dietary sugars offer you. Um, or you can ask other questions. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Ray Pete, uh, a renowned expert in many ways are on the subject of uh, saturated versus polyunsaturated oils uh, the hormones especially the longevity hormones um, and many many other topics so just to name a few we're talking about sugars now but obviously an expert in thyroid and other metabolic uh, situations so uh, from 7.30 on people are encouraged to uh, call him with any questions take advantage of his expert knowledge uh, it's KMUD RAD for those uh, familiar with the popular number or the uh, regular number is 923-3911. That's 1-800-KMUD RAD. Uh, sorry. And I know we had a <laughs> lot of callers last month that um, didn't get a chance to have their calls answered. So if um, you same people are listening tonight, please call in um, starting from 730. Okay, so... Uh, I, Interesting fact, and uh, it's something that you've, I think, has been brought out in one of your papers. Um, why do diabetic women have smarter, larger babies? Um, uh, I don't know whether last time I, I mentioned the uh, Zamenhof's experiments in uh, eggs developing uh, chicks in in the. I don't think so. No. Um, uh, he noticed that their brains stopped growing before they were ready to hatch, uh, two or three days. Uh, and he saw that the glucose that was in the egg originally was depleted before the whole body, the chick, had finished maturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he saw that the brain stopped just at the time that the glucose was depleted, and he knew from studies on mammals in the 1950s and 60s that uh, if you uh, give a pregnant animal either estrogen or insulin, uh, which will lower uh, the uh, supply of glucose, that their brain stops growing as long as the uh, glucose is below a certain limit. So he added, uh, made a little chip in the eggshell and injected some glucose right at the stage where the brain had stopped growing mm -hmm. and found that the, that caused the brain to keep growing and the chicken hatched with a, a brain bigger than chickens had ever normally had. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Smart chickens, huh? <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's a general thing that the in humans, uh, they see that about at six months gestation, uh, the brain has many more cells than it will have right. at birth. Mm -hmm. uh, so during that, from six to nine months, uh, cells are dying rather than mm -hmm. being created. Mm -hmm. And uh, diabetic women are able to, so-called diabetic, are able right. to deliver more glucose during that time and prevent uh, the death of this huge number of brain cells. And, I mean, well, how do you feel... When they give uh, women who have supposedly gestational diabetes and they, they want them to restrict their sugars. Well, um, I met some, some women, um, one who had, a, 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 I think he was four or five years old at the time, but her doctor had told her to restrict her sugar when she was pregnant again. And um, I asked about the development of the older boy and uh, she said that he uh, had taught himself to read uh, when he was I think two years old and that at the age of four he was wearing an adult sized hat <laughs> and was a, a very well behaved and precocious uh -huh. kid uh -huh. and I had heard many stories like that from uh, old obstetricians 
who associated it with the so-called diabetes. But that caused me to, to look up where the idea of gestational diabetes came from. And it was uh, in the 60s they were uh, promoting the idea of a glucose tolerance test to diagnose uh, diabetes very early. And it was out of those uh, situations uh, expanding the definition of diabetes that they uh, started noticing that uh, most pregnant women, healthy pregnant women, uh, tend to have about 130 uh, blood glucose, uh, quite a bit above the non-pregnant normal. And that uh, simply was redefined as uh, something that is off the, the scale of normal mm. uh, unpregnant people, and, and so they started thinking of pregnancy in terms of diabetes. But that's just the body's natural response when you're pregnant is to raise the sugar so the baby has more sugar? Is that? Um, yeah, one of the things that Zamenhof did at, besides adding glucose to the eggs or glycine was another thing mm. it turns into glucose. Um, he added progesterone and found that that also uh, keeps the brain growing and it uh, uh, helps to stabilize, make more efficient use of glucose uh, and uh, that glucose and progesterone work together. Uh, women with low progesterone tend to have unstable low blood sugar and uh, many more problems uh, with all through the pregnancy, uh, mostly related to uh, ups and downs of blood sugar. Okay, we've actually got a call on the line, Dr. P, so sorry to, sorry to cut you short. We'll get back to Zamenhof and, uh, and what you were talking about after we take this call. Are you on the air? Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Oh, good. Um, I, if this is not a question about my health because I'm kind of an organic fruit and vegetable gardener and great. But I've got a lady friend who is overweight and... I knew her when she wasn't overweight, and I I suspect that she needs to kick up her thyroid a bit, to, to kick up her metabolism so that she can burn that fat. And, and you're saying, the, the doctor, the guest, is saying yeah, certain sugars would do that? I mean, she's, she's pretty cool. She, she knows to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and stay away from too much carbohydrates and all that, but, uh, how, I must, I must have missed something. I came in late. How do, what's the relationship between the sugars and the, and the thyroid uh, being stimulated to, to, uh, kick up the metabolism? I'll take the answer off the air. I just, sure, I, okay. I don't quite, understand that relationship okay. okay thank you dr pete would you like to answer that question yeah if your diet isn't providing uh, either glucose or or the mixture of glucose and fructose um, your um, liver can't activate the thyroid hormone as as fully uh, if you're living on a high protein diet and fat uh, your um, liver will slow your whole body metabolism down. And uh, that's just as effective as if your thyroid gland had shut down. Now you're saying this because the liver converts T4, which is the inactive hormone, into T3. Yeah, yeah the right. liver um, makes about 60 or 70% of the active right. okay. uh, hormone. Okay. And um, <coughs> once your liver slows down, if you try to boost it just with the thyroxin T4, mm -hmm. uh, that will tend to turn your own thyroid hormone production down. Right. Uh, so uh, if you're going to supplement, it has to be a balanced uh, T3 and T4, but often just by avoiding the things that inhibit the uh, conversion of uh, thyroxin to the active form, uh, 
uh, avoiding too much of the muscle meats, Mm -hmm. uh, avoiding the polyunsaturated fats, Mm -hmm. and um, getting enough of the prothyroid nutrients and chemicals. Uh, Sucrose and lactose are both uh, effective at maintaining your production of uh, thyroid active hormone. So to summarize that, that would be limiting the amount of muscle meat means the um, steaks and burger and those types of meat. Uh, yeah, eating lots and, of and that, that includes fish too. And fish and chicken, mm-hmm. limiting those to a small portion per day or I mean, what would you recommend for a, um, a overweight person? How much oh, meat well, a day or a week should well, they eat? Well, if a person really wants to concentrate on on losing weight, uh, using milk as their main protein, milk and gelatin are the most favorable for weight loss, uh, partly because the milk comes with um, such a generous supply of calcium, and calcium powerfully stimulates uh, the metabolic rate. Um, and having enough salt in your food is another thing. Uh, the salt and the calcium interact to uh, stimulate your metabolic rate. Uh, the sugar in itself, the fructose in particular, uh, activates the, the the whole range of cells independently even, but it, it activates the production of the active thyroid hormone. And apart from that, uh, these things activate cells even if you're deficient in thyroid hormone. You can keep the activity going to a great extent with um, sucrose, salt, and calcium. So that's white sugar, salt, and calcium. And also um, the polyunsaturates, just in case there's some listeners that haven't heard our shows and Dr. Pete's uh, discussion on polyunsaturated fatty acids, those are powerfully thyroid toxic oils, and they are found practically everywhere. They're corn oil, soy oil, canola, safflower, sunflower, hemp, flaxseed, fish oil, um, cottonseed. Rapeseed. Rapeseed. Well, that's British, Sounds Jelly. Like, but yeah. <laughs> it's canola in this country. Um, okay. All those different <clears throat> vegetable oil. liquid oils. Anyway. No, canola is not corn oil. (laughs) All those liquid vegetable oils are very, very um, powerfully thyroid toxic, and they block the thyroid hormone in many different locations. Dr. Pete, weren't you talking about a French study? Didn't you mention to me a French study that showed that these liquid vegetable oils block uh, your thyroid hormone in like five different places? Yeah, that was a whole series of of studies that uh, showed that uh, they inhibit the secretion from the gland by blocking the digestive proteolytic enzymes, and they block the transport in the bloodstream and uh, several different places in the cells. Uh, One of the uh, protein uh, or enzymes that that binds and reacts to the thyroid hormone happens to be a key enzyme in the uh, response to fructose. Uh, it's activated both by thyroid and fructose. And the um, uh, key respiratory enzyme, uh, uh, cytochrome oxidase, is activated both by thyroid and fructose. Um, and the, the polyunsaturated fats block these intracellular places as well as the transport and production. So for your friend, um, for the last caller, for your friend, just to summarize, <laughs> avoiding the polyunsaturated fats and replacing those with coconut, butter, and um, a little bit of olive oil. It's, olive oil is more fattening than butter and coconut oil, but coconut oil specifically is going to be helping your friend with weight loss, along with lots of fruits, uh, lots of milk, and some cheese for protein, and a little bit of muscle meat. Yeah. Do you have any other suggestions for the caller, Dr. Pete? Oh, I'm um, keeping the intestine uh, happy, uh, not eating uh, too many raw indigestible foods. Um, if you have the wrong bacteria, uh, even um, 
supposedly good fiber, like grain fiber bran, uh, that can uh, support uh, the production of toxic uh, chemicals in your intestine under the action of bacteria. Okay. All right, well, we do have another caller on the line, Dr. Pete. So, uh, uh, caller, you're on the air? Yes. Um, thanks for the show. I have a friend who swears by a uh, diabetes cure of sorts. Um, she doesn't call it a complete cure, but but it's uh, 400 uh, international units of vitamin E and 1,200 milligrams of uh, lecithin. Hello? Hi. Well, you're, you're on the air. Did you get my question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll listen off the air, and, and I wonder what comment you'd have on that. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Um, lecithin generally is made uh, from soybeans. Uh, it could be extracted from eggs, and that would uh, affect the composition if the eggs ate good food. But generally, lecithin is uh, essentially the same as the, the polyunsaturated fats in corn oil or, or safflower oil. And, and so... Uh, a gram or so isn't going to make a big difference, but it, it does have a, a slightly uh, toxic effect. So I don't think it's a, a safe. It's not very dangerous, but it's it's not the safest way to approach diabetes. Okay. All right. Well, the, we've got another caller on the air, so let's take the uh, next caller. You're on the air? Good evening. Hi. Uh, along with your polyunsaturate um, list, you mentioned butter. Would could ghee be included as well? Um, actually, ghee and butter are saturated fats, so um, they oh, yeah. are they are not thyroid toxic, and they are very liver supportive. And they would the not be fats. amongst that yeah. list of corn, canola, soy, cottonseed, um, um, sunflower, safflower. Uh, in fact, these saturated fats have they're being researched as cures for liver disease because they are so protective to uh, cells that are under attack from the polyunsaturated fats. Uh, alcoholic liver disease is being treated with uh, the highly uh, highly saturated fats such as butter and uh, waxes from palm trees and cane and so on. Yeah, didn't you tell me about a study that's being done in India right now for alcoholic hepatitis? hepatitis? Uh, well, I think with it's butter? <laughs> Northwestern University is the last I heard about it, but it started in India. And it, it's a, a man named Nanji, who I think is from India, who is in doing the most research. Um, but there have been studies in the U.S. earlier uh, showing that uh, fructose, uh, protects uh, various organs um, against alcohol in pretty much the same way that it protects against diabetes. Um, they've, they've found that uh, you can uh, stimulate the uh, removal of uh, a toxic amount of ethyl alcohol from the body by uh, giving the person some fructose. Mm. So if someone's going to drink, then they want to have a vodka and mm. orange juice, right? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. The fructose uh, actually uh, detoxifies the alcohol better than mm. than ordinary glucose. <laughs> We've actually got two more callers on the line, Dr. Pete, so perhaps we'll take the uh, next caller. Thank you. My name is uh, Mike, and I'm, uh, I I'm interested in finding out about dairy and... Um, Dr. Peek was talking about uh, sugar and proteins, okay. and he mentioned different types of proteins. Uh, and my question is, uh, A, I've heard or did some reading that fertilized eggs are supposed to be better for you than non-fertilized eggs. And I'd like to get... Um, uh, anybody's opinion there, Dr. Peace included, or uh, Andrew, or uh, okay. the other person. Sarah. And, uh, I'll take my uh, 
quick uh, answer off the air. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cole. Dr. Pete, do you have any... Uh... Yeah, I think there actually could be a difference because uh, when uh, chickens are kept in tiny boxes where the eggs are, won't get fertilized, mm -hmm. uh, they're under, under extreme stress, right. and uh, the stress is undoubtedly reflected in the egg. Right. And so if they uh, have the freedom of movement that would be necessary for fertilization, uh, I think the eggs are going to be healthier. Yeah. Okay. Stands to reason. Yes, that does. That makes sense. Okay, good. We've uh, we've got another caller on the line, so let's take this other caller. Yes, hello. Hi, you're on the air. Yeah, I, I want to ask, uh, <clears throat> this is, um, okay, about cholesterol. Um, okay. Uh, now, um, I know Lipitor is, like, really... Um, uh, being pushed around quite a bit, and I've always I've heard that it's like not good for your liver, and um, it seems like doctors are crazy to put you on Lipitor if your cholesterol is too high. And my daughter recently was told by her doctor that the doctor is not happy with her cholesterol level. She's tried to lower it with diet, and it's not like super high, but she Gina. thinks her doctor thinks it's too high and says if you if it isn't lower in six months, I'm going to put you on Lipitor, and I really have my trepidations about this Lipitor, and also I've heard uh, some controversial things about cholesterol anyway, that maybe, you know, just uh, the level of cholesterol is not necessarily related to, you know, you're going to get heart disease mm -hmm. because your cholesterol is a little high necessarily. What, so uh, I'd like to know what you think, you know, about the cholesterol issue in itself and how much it really does relate to heart disease. and. What do you think about Lipitor? Is it uh, dangerous to take, or you know, do you think people should run out and take this medicine to lower their cholesterol so they won't get a heart attack? Can I just ask you what, what what your daughter's cholesterol was? Do you, do you remember? I, I can't remember okay. exactly. Oh. Well, how old, how old is your How old is your daughter? Uh, she's about thirty eight. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> there have been several studies showing that uh, lowering cholesterol by uh, any drug means uh, has pretty serious side effects. Like and what? That's because cholesterol is next to uh, glucose. It's probably our single most important protective all-purpose molecule. Um, the reason it rises during stress in a fairly healthy person is that it's our defensive molecule. And... It's the precursor to the anti-stress hormones. Uh, it's used massively in making the steroids, uh, such as pregnenolone, DHEA, and progesterone. And if you artificially lower the uh, supply of cholesterol in the blood, you're going to just uh, proportionally push down the amount of progesterone you can make. And uh, that seems to be why it uh, causes so many disastrous effects, uh, uh, increasing the general mortality in people who uh, are, are using drugs to push down the cholesterol. But could you tell me what some of these bad effects are of Lipitor? Um, uh, that particular drug, I I don't know, uh, but uh, muscle... It's probably the most popular one for lowering, lowering cholesterol. Well, one of the things that has turned up a lot in recent years is um, breakdown of muscle, skeletal muscle, uh, first pains and then uh, sometimes uh, uh, seepage of enzymes and uh, myoglobin into the blood damaging the kidneys. Well, the, the Lipitor is a statin drug, I believe. So um, aren't statins really hard on your liver, Dr. Pete? Yeah, um, but, and it's, it's through that effect, I think, that they affect the, the muscles. The muscles um, are destabilized if if they aren't getting enough cholesterol. Uh, all of your organs, including the brain, <coughs> suffer when when your liver isn't supplying enough cholesterol, even though other cells can make it. Uh, the liver is well, there. Why, do they, why are they so upset about your cholesterol being a little on the high side? You know, I'm not talking about really super high, but, you know, above the level it's supposed to be healthy. Why are they so concerned about that as if that's going to kill you when it sounds like the medicine's worse for you? Um, yeah, there, there was a study a few years ago of, of older people uh, in 
nursing homes, for example, uh, looking at their uh, cholesterol as they aged and uh, seeing what the life expectancy was in relation to cholesterol. And uh, the longest lived people, uh, I think, were up around 280 uh-huh. milligrams of uh-huh. cholesterol. Uh, so, you, so, so if it's not, you know, above 300 or so, then it's probably safer to have a little high cholesterol than to take these medicines that would compromise your liver, kidneys, and muscles. Yeah, a Framingham study about 20 years ago saw that after the age of 50, people who have below 200 cholesterol are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Okay. It's a so, very protective substance. And so, so what do you think? Okay, so it protects a lot of things, but why do they think it's so bad uh, that it's going to give you a heart attack and a um, stroke? And... Well, there are some good articles. Uh, Chris Masterjohn has one. I think I have one on my website. Uh, well, I don't have a computer. I don't do the Internet. Thing. Oh. If you could just quickly say something about it. Um, it, it was uh, basically developed as a way to sell drugs and, and products, and it um, never, since the 1930s, it's been known that uh, hypothyroid people are susceptible to many diseases, including heart disease, and that hypothyroidism is the basic cause of increased cholesterol because uh, cholesterol... Uh, has to be converted to progesterone under the influence of thyroid hormone. So if you're low in thyroid hormone, your body increases cholesterol to keep the progesterone production going. Well, my daughter actually takes uh, thyroid. She's supposed to, she apparently her thyroid. Well, maybe she needs to take a T3, T4 um, drug called Thyrolar. She's probably only taking Synthroid or, or Lavoxyl. Uh, the yeah. the metabolic rate is a mirror image of the blood cholesterol level, so that uh, when your metabolic rate is below normal, your cholesterol will defensively rise above normal. And as you increase your metabolic rate, your cholesterol will come down as a mirror image. But doctors have uh, disregarded the effect on the metabolic rate and they prescribe only uh, the inactive part of the thyroid hormone, and very often people stay hypometabolic despite taking thyroid. Okay, one more quick question about the sugar thing. Um, uh, Now, uh, are you saying that uh, that sugars, even white sugar, I know that high fructose corn syrup isn't so good, but fruit sugars from fruit and fruit juice, and, and even white sugar is okay, but the bad thing is like white flour, white rice, white white pasta, white uh, carbohydrates, uh, what they call the simple carbohydrates. You say that's the real, what what is the more worse, more bad for you. So let's say if you eat sugar in, let's say, a good ice cream, uh, is that that's better way if you can eat sugar than in, let's say, a pastry or something with flour in it. Voila. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Get okay, so it's not head. necessarily sugars that people should cut out, but um, it's the refined carbohydrates that, that they need to lower uh, to lose weight. And yeah, the starches and the polyunsaturated fats are the main culprits in fatness. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you very much. And another thing I wanted to mention about the um, cholesterol is, Think of the cholesterol as a bandage because, Dr. Pete, you told me about a study that the Japanese came out with showing that actual arteries are blocked up by polyunsaturated fats, all these vegetable oils, and the body bandages it over with a cholesterol plaque. Uh, yeah, yeah, the unsaturated fats are very reactive with oxygen, and the bloodstream is where there's the most oxygen for them to react with. Uh, the saturated fats... Uh, that we make in the liver, if we eat too much sugar and uh, are low thyroid and have high estrogen and high cortisol and such, we might have high triglycerides. But these made in the liver are saturated, Mm. and they happen to be protective to the heart. Um, So the the thing is to uh, avoid the the things that cause the um, distorted 
uh, blood lipids, not to try to lower the, the mm-hmm. lipids themselves, but to remove the cause. Right. So look, so if someone has high cholesterol, try to find out what's causing that. If it's low thyroid, get that treated. We can um, talk to you more about that maybe on the next show. But I do have, the engineer has a question, Dr. Pete. Okay. She wants to know what you think of Splenda and all the artificial sweeteners. Well, that Splenda, I think, is the one that has chlorine in the molecule. And that exposed to bacteria, the bacteria can break down the molecule and liberate things in the family of organic chlorine compounds mm-hmm. like uh, mm-hmm. uh, chloroform-related uh, toxic substances. So I wouldn't uh, right. want my intestine exposed <laughs> to Splenda. Or how, how, how about stevia? It's pretty safe. Yeah, because I hear they're actually wanting to take it off the market in America. I think it's maybe getting too much of a foothold as a safe alternative. And uh, I saw some press release about the FDA um, and some controls. They want it to. They, they want to basically crack down on it. I couldn't couldn't quite understand it. It seemed uh, seemed a bit too bizarre. But okay, well there we are. Um, Sarah, do you have anything else? No, I think yeah. that's it. So um, basically, all those, those sorry, well, all those artificial sweeteners, Doctor Pete, you, you'd recommend to our listeners that they avoid those. Yeah, uh, sugar is so much more nourishing, <laughs> thank protective. You. Thank you, Dr. Pete. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pete. I just want to let people that are listening know how they can reach you or how they can read more about your research. Uh, we've been joined by Dr. Ray Pete, uh, endocrinologist and research scientist. Uh, he has a website. It's www.raypeat.org. Oh, gosh, .com. Oh, gosh, I keep saying <laughs> that. I'm sorry. I need more thyroid. Okay, raypeat.com. Um, and there are lots of articles uh, on his homepage, and they're uh, all reference scientific articles. And that's spelled R A Y P E A T. Dot com. Dot <laughs> com. Okay. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Okay, Pete. Thank you. And uh, for those people uh, who have been listening, um, we can be contacted uh, during normal business hours, Monday through Friday, and nine to five. Uh, we have our phone number is. Uh, you want to get out the regular toll free. Toll free. There you go. If you want to call toll free, it's one eight 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 nine two six four three seven two, and that stands for W B M Herb for Western Botanical Medicine Herb. Or you can call us on our local number seven zero seven nine eight six nine five zero six. We look forward to hearing from anybody and everybody with any further questions about this show or other shows we've done in the past. Thank you for listening. Yep, and for those who tune in this evening and to those who have ears, let them hear. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you next month when the clocks will be going back and it'll be dark on our way into the studio until ooh, April. So uh, get the fires burning and get yourselves shut down for some recuperation. We'll see you on November 19th. Thank you for listening.